thank you all. Hopefully you got a little bit of break. I know um, we are going a little over, but that's why we have breaks. And um, we saw an excellent presentation and demo, which we did not want to cut off for you. So um, our next speaker is Adam Mash, also known as Mash. And he is actually, well, I'm new to the company, but my new coworker. So uh, I actually met Mash uh, a while back. We worked together on the C2 matrix mm -hmm. project, which if you heard Ed Scotus today uh, talk about the H2 matrix, that is uh, where he got the idea from. It's a command and control matrix. We have 47 command and controls that a lot of us evaluate and it's open for contributors. So worked with Adam there um, at first and now uh, this is actually day five that I'm with Scythe um, and, and working with Adam. So that's, that's awesome stuff. Adam um, has been in industry for a bit. Uh, he is with Scythe, as I mentioned, as a VP of product management. And today he's going to talk about MITRE ATT&CK. And that, while it's something that a lot of people have heard, especially our audience here of uh, quite a few people, a lot of people actually don't know or feel kind of overwhelmed. I definitely felt that way when I first saw MITRE ATT&CK and I'm like, okay, it's just like a, a table and like, what, what do I do? So Adam's gonna answer all those questions. Uh, for you and uh, this actual version two of a, uh, of a talk that he gave before. So if you did see that one, that's awesome. I'm sure he'll cover some of the basics to bring everyone up to speed. And you know we have people from all over the world and all different experience levels. So without further ado, go for it, Mash. All right, thanks. I appreciate the intro, George. And you know, it's, it's great that, you know, to have you as part of the team as well. So um, to dive right into it, uh, let's go see if I can go ahead and take over and share or, well, ah, there we go. Okay. So hopefully everybody can see this here. So what we'll be talking about today is the quick start guide to MITRE ATT&CK and, and really focusing on the do's and don'ts when using the matrix because everybody talks about the MITRE ATT&CK matrix. It's all over the industry. It's, you know, the new framework that everybody's looking at, all the products and all the vendors are looking at. So this is intended to just be like, okay, well, I don't want to read any PDFs. I don't I want to go do a ton of research. Just what's the quick and easy way to understand this? So hopefully you all who are attending this will get something out of it as far as the quick start guide and some helpful do's and don'ts and ways to think about it. So uh, you, some of you who are like, I think I've heard this talk before, or maybe I've seen this. Uh, it's true. There's actually a version one of this talk, and we're now on to version two. So this is, I'm, you know, I couldn't resist. The attack matrix reloaded. So this is version two of that. Um, so moving on, a quick preface just before we get started. Um, here, we'll be talking about a lot of things, and we'll be moving very quickly through it. And, and, but these slides will be shared, um, so you don't need to screenshot everything or record it or whatever. We've got all that taken care of for you. I will provide sources. They're in the speaker notes of the slide, so you'll have those. And I'm going to use memes in this. Uh, however, there's a lot of text in the speaker notes as well. So if you don't care about memes, there's a text version of it underneath the, the, the visual PowerPoint here. Um, really quick, so who am I? Um, I'm Adam Mashinchi. I am often confused, and these folks are also confused for me, especially because now I think all of us have beards too. Um, I'm this one. Uh, I'm the VP of product for Scythe. We do adversary emulation simulations, so that it does synthetic malware creation, red team automation, controls validation, whatever. Um, I also uh, do some work with the Red Team Village at DEF CON. And I'm a volunteer speaker with them. And I've got a background in enterprise solutions and cryptography and security and all those fun things. Anyway, enough about me. Um, let's talk about this presentation again just one more time. So who's this for? Especially version one of this, which I'll still present on. People who are curious about MITRE ATT&CK. You hear about it a lot. What is it? Folks that are red, blue, purple, it doesn't matter which team you're on, this is valuable things. How it can and maybe should be used, uh, the attack matrix, some insights from some industry experts, um, some new analogies, metaphors, hopefully, some further reading and takeaways for you all to try some stuff. And in the, the version of this talk that you're about to see, I'll also talk about the state of 
the MITRE Tech Matrix and some upgrades that are happening, uh, specifically about sub-techniques. Some of the changes gone on at MITRE, which again, we'll talk about in a moment. And I'm gonna briefly mention the Attack Navigator and give a, maybe a recommendation or some homework for everyone to try that out. So what this talk is, it's a very, very, very fast review. Uh, it's not just a 100% like review of the 101 guide. There is literally a getting started guide by the MITRE team. Like it's, it's not this. Um, uh, I'm going to oversimplify a lot of things. I'm going to mention some tools, but not show them at all. Uh, they'll uh, have a lot of feedback from humans, but it's, this is not comprehensive. It's not a how-to guide, and I'm not going to perfectly attribute everything you're going to hear. I'm going to do my best, and you'll notice there's Twitter handles at the bottom corners. Anyway, let's get started. So the problem, the problem that uh, it's likely uh, almost all of you are encountering right now, it's just MITRE ATT&CK is all over the place. Uh, Bryson Bort, uh, I, I, I love this tweet. It's just, you know, my next presentation will be MITRE ATT&CK review of MITRE ATT&CK using MITRE ATT&CK, like ding, 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 bingo. Or we, we're starting to see other things about like uh, marketing spam, substantially MITRE ATT&CK framework compliant. Like there's no such thing as that. Like it's not, there's no MITRE ATT&CK compliancy. And so, now that we're just all being bombarded by the term MITRE ATT&CK, um, what is it? Like, what is it in its most basic form? Um, so let's break down the term. MITRE is a not-for-profit, federally funded R&D shop. It's an organization, a bunch of great people there. They do all sorts of work. And the MITRE ATT&CK matrix is just one part of that. Now, ATT&CK itself is a grid of threat actor behaviors. That, that's its most basic form. That's what that matrix is, the attack matrix. So it's a framework of tactics, techniques, procedures, TTPs, and specific identifiers for those, like literally just like technique, one, two, three, four. Like it's, it's all made very specific in that way in those examples. And for the sake of this conversation, when I use the term threat actor, this is adversary seen in the cybersecurity industry, like broad, broadly speaking. So there's actually multiple MITRE ATT&CK matrices or matrices or whatever. Um, and the one we care about today is the enterprise matrix. There's a bunch of them. Uh, there's cloud ones and pre-attack and ICS and mobile. Uh, we're not going to talk about those today because the one that most of us care about is the enterprise MITRE ATT&CK matrix. Um, it was a, created, the matrix, by the team at MITRE. It's a great team. And the, the original kind of founding or uh, figurehead of that was Blake Strom. Oh, that's uh, right there. Fix that picture there. Um, so that's actually uh, Blake Strom there. And here's a bunch of other folks that have are been really important as far as that the, the matrix's development. So we're going to talk more about some of these uh, kind of changes in the organization there at MITRE uh, a little bit later. But for now, these are some good Twitter folks to follow if you like the MITRE attack matrix. Okay, just moving right along, let's talk about the do's and don'ts. This, this is the, probably the most salient way I can say the recommend to think about the MITRE ATT&CK matrix. Um, use it as a common language. So the goal is, regardless of how technical you are, regardless of which team you're on, regardless of where you are in the, your cybersecurity career or whether you're an executive, it doesn't matter. You can use the matrix as a way to have a conversation with people that are different from you in the industry, right? So whether you are technical and you're trying to represent a, a threat actor to an executive, um, or whether or not you're a red team and a blue team and you're trying to think about uh, adversary behavior versus specific threat actors versus specific IDs for you know, different signatures, all these things, you can use the matrix as a common language because regardless of where you are, everybody can understand a grid with some words, with some colors, like everybody can get that. And so using this as a common language to talk about these threat techniques and these different signatures and different threat actors is really helpful because although not everyone necessarily understands what sticky keys are, everybody can understand what a key locker is, right? And if you see a, on a grid, the word key locker in red, that indicates something and everybody can understand that. So this is the number one point I hope to make today is think of it as a common language and then everything else is kind of an aside to that. Now, it's very, very tempting to think of it as a checklist. Like, oh, well, here's a bunch of threat actor techniques. If I, as a red teamer, can achieve some of these things, I'm winning, right? If I light up the entire grid with things that I'm doing in engagement, 
woohoo, I've won, right? Or as a, uh, from a defensive perspective, oh, we absolutely monitor for X, Y, and Z techniques or this entire column is done. We're done. We don't have to think about that anymore. Resist the temptation to think of this as a checklist or to say we have 100% miter attack coverage, right? Because it's missing the point. And there's lots of different ways to achieve these technique goals and it's easy to forget that. So as tempting as it may be, do not think of this as a checklist. So instead of focusing on the exact signature of each one of these matrix things, because they each have examples, right? So for example, you might see in the matrix, oh, one way to achieve system time discovery. So that's T1124 here. Um, one way to do that in an example of that is net, net time backslash host name. Cool. Yeah, and so you, maybe you write a signature for that, or maybe you test for that command. And you say, well, we've achieved T1124. We are done. We're blocking that, or we're monitoring for that. Now we've fully achieved T1124 protection. But that's not really focusing on the adversary behavior. It's missing the spirit of what these matrix items are attempting to do. Because there's a, a ton of different ways that you can, and a threat actor could achieve T1124. PowerShell get date, woohoo, right? Like the, it, the idea is, is that don't tie these things to specific signatures necessarily. They're categories. They're ways to think about these things, but don't tie them to a specific command and assume they are done because threat actors like to manipulate these. Instead, think of it as a periodic table for adversaries, right? And these, the chemical makeup of these threat actors is context, an order of operations, a given state. All of these things are important. And although you can wire a threat actor together and you can create an example of that with TTPs, keep in mind that those individual icons on the threat matrix are just inert objects. They can be different and manipulated and they can be swapped out. And so threat actors combine these together and change constantly, they're organic. And so using this as a chemical makeup to think about adversaries is a good way to look into it. And use these examples as a foundation. Now, that's not to say you create a threat that is you know, this threat actor and you're done, you never have to touch it again. Instead, you can use these things as a, a base point to say, okay, I want to emulate this kind of threat actor as a, as a behavior, either as a red team or blue team or otherwise. And I want to use this as a baseline to get started. So to test for these behaviors and to run some example commands, it's a great way to get started. So, for example, Caldera is, a, is an open source project provided by the MITRE team that does a ton of adversarial testing, right? And so it's open source and it creates agents and it fires a series of commands that will align to specific technique IDs. This is all great. And you can use tools like, the, uh, like Caldera to s begin to simulate these threat actor behaviors. But although it might make that your, your validation of that specific thing to the specific threat you're using, trivial, although it makes it really easy to validate against that, it is just a playbook at the end of the day. It's not the end-all be-all for all threat actors or that even that threat actor as they grow over time. So we you know, absolutely use these sorts of tools, but don't be beholden to the one run of it. And this, uh, and I'm kind of re reiterating a few points in different ways just to really uh, drive some of these points home. So again, assume TTPs uh, assuming TTPs are a given threat actor, that's the wrong way to think about it. Don't do that. And because these different techniques and these examples and these ways of adversarial behavior, these things are nuanced. And it, it's often really tricky to replicate these things given the modern tooling that we have. And sometimes, uh, you know, threat intel companies will often provide, oh, here's a threat actor, here's some domains, here's some MV5 hashes, and here's some MITRE attack IDs associated with the behavior that we saw. Cool how did the threat actor actually do it, right? Or how are they changing their behaviors over time? It's very tricky to replicate these things one for one and you have to be able to think organically about it. Um, and we, again, we often will find a false sense of security where a team will say, oh, we're monitoring for all of the examples of this column of the MITRE attack matrix. Cool, but just because you've seen that once or that you've used it as a checklist again, um, the tests can vary and the threat actor will grow organically. And these, the, the concepts of these TTPs is not necessarily how you should implement them one for one. And it does take some critical thinking. And this could mean that if you're running some tests or you're using a playbook or something like Caldera and you're able to signature these things and you say, okay, well now we have a really good baseline for this. Keep in mind that one day your defenses or your validations 
could not be applicable anymore because the threat actor could change and they could still achieve those goals via different methods. One way I really like to, uh, to hear the, the MITRE attack matrix referred to as, and a good way to think about it was by Jeff McJunkin. So shout out to him for this one. Um, when red teams can think about MITRE attack matrix, they can think about it as the different techniques as a game of minesweeper. So as you, as an offensive uh, actor, are going through and achieving different goals, you don't know how the defender or which different techniques a defender is watching. So right, maybe they care a lot about key loggers, but not at all about system time discovery. Or maybe they care a lot about kinds of lateral movement, but not some other kinds. These are, uh, or, or other sorts of monitoring or collection or exfiltration. And you don't necessarily know which one of these techniques is going to be triggered. And so you, as you watch the clock count down and you're, you're trying to move your way through an organization or achieve specific goals, you can think of a threat actor in this way. And I, I just love this analogy because as you're compromising different hosts, uh, you're, the, the countdown is starting and you don't know where their detective controls are in. So again, thanks to Jeff for, for this uh, analogy. I think it's great. Um, and then a quick side anecdote, uh, I've, I've spoken to some red teamers and one of my favorite things that, that uh, stories that I heard about the MITRE attack matrix is they had put a bunch of technique IDs on a wheel and when they were in an engagement, they would just spin it and it would land and they were like, okay, I guess we have to test for that specific threat. So that's a very silly way to think about different, testing for different techniques on a red team engagement, but I just love this idea and I thought I would include it. All right, another don't is copy, paste and enter. Uh, before I show this next slide, I want to preface it by saying there's some things I really love about uh, folks in the community and who are doing great work and working with the MITRE Attack Matrix. So uh, Red Canary is a great team and a great organization. The Atomic Red Team Open Source Project that they created is awesome. I really love practical examples provided by the community and by MITRE and by everyone about how to achieve these specific technique ideas. So I want to say that all out loud. I love these things. However, I don't necessarily understand how we got to the point where we have started providing examples that look like this, where you're like, hey, if you want to test for credential dumping, you should just copy and paste this PowerShell command here that calls out to Bitly somewhere and invokes maybe cats and does some stuff. Like, I think that when we're doing these tests, we should be pretty cautious about the kind of arbitrary URLs we're calling out to and commands that may not make sense. Maybe you should be cautious before you run them, especially in a production environment. So I don't necessarily recommend that we copy and paste every example that you might find for a MITRE attack technique. So just tread, tread carefully. And again, we're all in the cybersecurity industry and how we're becoming comfortable with like copying and pasting downloads from Bitly is strange. So just a word of caution there. Don't forget that a given technique is not just one command and not just one example command. And I've said this a number of different ways, but just to, to, to kind of drill it home, adversaries use a lot of different techniques and they do sorts of clever things like encoding their queries. And it, it just, it's so tempting to say, oh, we are logging and flagging on this one specific command because we know threat actors use that and we can be done. Threat actors are always changing and detecting these behaviors can be difficult and it's okay to use them as a baseline, but don't let yourself fall into that false sense of security. And remember that one technique can be all sorts of different commands and it's a great exercise to think of those things yourself as well and to create new campaigns and, and put those in your library. Also, this is a big one. As exciting as MITRE ATT&CK is and how vendors and teams and enterprises are all moving to it as a framework, it's easy to forget like, oh, there's actually a ton of other standards out there. And just because this is very cool and it's pretty easy to use and lots of vendors are talking about it, don't forget that your organization may have other standards that you need to abide by. And that's uh, an important thing. So you have to prioritize your standards based on the systems you use, the data you process, the threats that are uh, associated with those things. And, and really, regardless of the kind of model you use, whether it's MITRE ATT&CK or otherwise, don't use these things as a bingo card. Don't just say, oh, we achieve X, Y, and Z, we're done, right? It's the, that false sense of security, again, is the one thing these, these frameworks have the ability to uh, instill in us, and we have to resist that temptation. So don't use them as big bingo cards, but also make sure your priorities for what standards you're using for categorization is, is still kept in mind. 
So to summarize, really, the first chunk of this, uh, let's use the MITRE TAC matrix as a common language. Um, let's use it as a baseline for behavior. It's a good place to get started. And use it as an opportunity to get involved. You know, this is a framework that gets very community driven and it's great whether you're blogging about it or providing examples to it or doing PRs against the Atomic Red Team project, just get involved. It's, it's, it's a really great way to do that. It's very easy to understand the MITRE attack matrix once you take a look at it. Hopefully this presentation is helping a little bit, um, but there's so many avenues for community engagement and I can't encourage that involvement enough. Now, Version one of this ended with the following. I said, none of this will matter soon, any of the things I presented on, because of sub-techniques. And sub-techniques was something that in the first version of this, uh, the, the joke was we were going to, you know, march away from the existing MITRE attack matrix and blow it up. And, uh, you know, uh, that was going to be a big, uh, a big to do. And, and so that was how I originally ended the one of this uh, presentation. Well, um, it turns out I kind of accidentally predicted something with my joke. So the first thing that happened was they, uh, the minor attack team launched sub-techniques as of, in beta, and that was a big deal. I mean, sub-techniques, we knew it was coming. We finally got to see what it looked like, and that, that, that happened. And then shortly after that, uh, Blake Strom, who was kind of the uh, original figurehead and, and kind of founded the MITRE attack matrix, also left MITRE. So this whole like <laughs> the blowing up the water tower <laughs> as you walk away thing, oops, I did, didn't mean to, to call that one. Um, now uh, at the helm is uh, Adam uh, Pennington. It's a great name, very good name. Uh, and, and so Adam is awesome. Uh, he's going to do great work at the helm of the MITRE ATT&CK team. And so you can follow him on Twitter there as well. And so that, that's a good thing, right? As far as my, my accidental prediction with the, the koala blowing up the water tower. Um, and then the last part of my prediction was that some techniques were going to break a lot of stuff. Uh, from a vendor perspective, from a parser perspective, from a community perspective, some techniques were really going to change the game. And, and consequently, like with the release of this thing, all of these MITRE ATT&CK parsers are just in trouble, including, you know, the attack team zone parser. So it's, it's good that it was released in beta first so we can all kind of t uh, hone these sorts of things in. Um, now, an overview, a very, very fast overview of sub-techniques and the way uh, with the think about them in the MITRE attack matrix. So again, we have this grid of technique IDs, these threat actor behaviors. Now, a given cell of that matrix can have kind of sub-techniques off of it. It has sub-organization off of it. And so the sub-techniques that came into beta in March and the ETA on the delivery of those things, having them be in production on the MITRE ATT&CK matrix is early July. And it's worth noting that there's a, a few significant changes. One, that we have the original technique IDs. We also have this new context of dot notation. So if we, you'll see something like T432.001 or, uh, or you know, one through whatever, depending on how many sub-techniques there are. Um, and this is to help with that organization because there might be techniques that make sense to be nested under other ones. Um, they also remapped a number of technique IDs. So they, they did some of that nesting for us already. So for example, uh, 1081 is now 1552001. Um, it's worth noting though, for those of you who write minor attack parsers, that 1081, it's just, it's gone now. Like that's, that thing is no longer in existence. So that's worth noting. Some technique IDs have been deprecated and those things are just to be written to null as well. So again, for those of you who are mapping this or have legacy reports or writing parsers, some of those things are gone. And also some tools, uh, their names got changed, which is normal, right? As we as an industry start to talk about these things, uh, where, where we start to see more and more opportunities for uh, changes in growth because these things do need to be organic because the threat actor landscape is constantly changing. So there's just a few bullet points of what sub techniques are bringing to the table. It, as much as I love sub techniques and I think it's a good thing, it does add a level of complexity that is made some things tricky. So for example, the attack navigator, what I'm showing here, um, navigating it and kind of clicking around inside of it has become a little more cumbersome. So you have to learn a few different things and it, it is certainly a, a little trickier than it was before. And so just know and you should expect things to be a little more complex than they were originally. Um, spe well, speaking of navigator and navigation, 
This thing is another tool that I highly, highly recommend everybody take a look at. Now, a lot of folks, uh, same with when, you, when you're first getting started with the MITRE ATT&CK matrix and thinking about it, it can be very overwhelming. And the MITRE ATT&CK navigator, this, this UI, is also very daunting at first glance. There's a lot of stuff and there's things that are happening and you know, visualizations and highlighting and all sorts of things. I highly recommend everyone take a look at this and spend just even 10 minutes to process it try some of the controls out and just play with this user interface a little bit. And I have a really specific kind of recommendation or homework. Um, the way the navigator works is it's trying to make it so you can import and export and utilize visualizing the MITRE ATT&CK matrix in a trivial way. But I think the, one of the best ways to begin thinking about it is to open it up and look at all of the techniques there are, right? And it's, again, it's overwhelming at first. But if you slow down and you think, well, what about my organization? What do I as a red teamer or a blue teamer or someone on the purple team, what, what's important to us as an organization? Maybe we really care about key loggers or maybe we really care about things that can sniff clipboard data or, or what have you. Um, how can I visualize that? And how can I write that as a presentation for my own self? Well, if you select a, a, a cell here in the, the attack navigator, there's also this little button to give it a score. And there's this whole, it's got one to a hundred. It does coloring for you, like red to green. Um, I recommend everybody take some time and just sit down with the attack navigator and say, you know what, I'm going to give my subjective perspective on how I think about these threat actor techniques and how important they are to me. And that is as, as a way to drive this common language forward, you'll wind up with a grid that has some green, some yellow, some red, and you could say, oh, I now have a way to visualize how my team or myself are thinking about these threat actor behaviors. And you could say, hand it to an executive and say, hey, I, I made this, what do you think? And now you can start to iterate through these and this can drive entire decision models about an organization because Maybe you as a defensive member say, I really care if uh, you know, these kinds of commands are run or these kinds of uh, threats are run on endpoints. But an executive will say, you know, based on our board analysis, I hear you, but these other things are more important. And you can collaborate together on these navigation UIs. You can import them and export them as layers and all sorts of cool things. You know, there's JSON imports. I mean, it's really an amazing tool. And although it might be easy to get overwhelmed on it, it's worth learning how to even click around and score some of these things and disable them to make it relevant to you. And I think this is the best way to utilize some of the advice, hopefully I've <laughs> imparted today, um, and to action some of these things and to think about the MITRE ATT&CK matrix and use it as that common language. So try it out, um, try the, the ATT&CK navigator out, Research some of these technique IDs if you've never heard of them or you don't know any examples of them. There's a lot of information. The, the attack matrix provides that. And, you know, as an extra credit way to think about this, try out using the sub techniques in the attack navigator as well. It's a little tricky to get used to, but it's, it's okay. And it's, this is where the industry is going and all the vendors are going to do sub techniques here soon, hopefully, and everybody will be moving in that direction. And so with that, um, that's it. Again, I just wanted this to be a really quick and concise way to think about the MITRE ATT&CK matrix. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions. We might. Uh, if we do, great. Uh, we can take some of those now. But hopefully this was a, a really you know, pristine way to think about the MITRE ATT&CK matrix and it makes it a little less overwhelming. And uh, there's some good takeaways and maybe this is the kind of presentation you just send to someone who should probably know some of these things as well. So thank you everyone for, for the time. Yeah. Today. yeah. Thank you, Adam. That was awesome. Uh, I love the jokes as well. I laughed uh, just over here. I know it's difficult virtually. You don't get a sense of the crowd, you know, laughing at the fact that you like the a Adam Pennington's name is, is a cool name. <laughs> it is a great name. It's a great name. I highly support that. Unless him and I wind up in the same presentation, in which case there's Highlander rules, right? And then we'll have to just deal with that when that moment comes. So, Excellent. Yeah, and we got um, a lot of feedback. Again, if you would like to ask questions, there is hallway, Adam where you can pop in there and ask. Of course, your uh, friends, uh, Jeff McJunkin and, and others um, have been sharing on social media a number of the funny things uh, that you said, um, talking about Minesweeper and um, how some people don't know what Minesweeper is, except for the fact that 
it's an Easter egg inside of Mimikatz, which um, is funny in itself. Have but, we got um, to the point where referencing Minesweeper has dated myself? Is that where we are yeah, now? Yes, okay. that's, that, cool. that is where we are. It, Good to it's know. It's no longer included with uh, <laughs> Microsoft as a game. Oh, goodness. Um, we have a question here. Uh, Juan Isais asking, if you've ever looked at the detect project and what do you think about it? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And unfortunately, I don't feel like I've got a, a good enough amount of information on that to answer in an eloquent way that would be useful to this audience. So it's something I've looked at. Um, I, I really like that. Uh, uh, kind of like the C2 matrix and now the H2 matrix. Uh, I, I like that there's these really good frameworks coming out and people saying, hey, I have a really cool way that I th I'm thinking about that and a way that we can spin this out. So I, I recommend taking a look at things like the, the tech matrix. I just don't know if I have enough good, good knowledge yeah, no, of it yet to be, to be useful on this. And that's the other thing, right? It's like everyone's building stuff that maps back to MITRE attack in some way or another, which is great. I mean, definitely keep giving back to the community, but yeah. it's become so hard. And I mean, you reference C2 matrix. And one of the things we've had there that we wanted to do was map to MITRE attack. And of course we haven't done that because we're waiting for sub techniques, not because we're working on anything else, but um, you know, it has become, you know, it's, it's like the standard because it has created, you know, a language where threat intelligence can speak with red team and they can speak with blue team. And when everyone's speaking the same language, it you know becomes a lot better to communicate to work together and of course the efficiencies of that purple team right which isn't just red and blue it's red blue and cti working together so you know mad props for for miter and i, I know um the folks over there are, are going to do a great job mm -hmm. um after blake left and and take it over right adam has been part of that miter uh team for for years as well. So looking forward to that. Um, you touched a little bit on the new sub techniques and adding colons to it and how that will change. And, you know, being the project uh, product manager management and um, VP at, at Scythe, which maps to MITRE attack. What are some of the tougher things that you think people that are mapping to MITRE attack, right? And detect being one of those projects or any others, right? There's so many projects that map. What, what do you think are going to be the biggest concerns and what's going to make it harder to kind of migrate from the current view to sub techniques? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and from a, there, there's kind of two answers to it. The one is the technical one where everybody looks at it's like, oh, we hard coded these things to be five characters with a T and then four digits. Uh oh, right. So there, there's a really practical engineering problem that hopefully people didn't do that. But now there's a whole new syntax for it and we have to adjust for it. But the other one that is, is going to be pretty common is there seems to be this divide in the industry about um, should a given, say, command or a, a specific action taken have more than one technique ID associated with it. And that there's a, a lot of different opinions on this. Some, some products say one only, some products say any amount you want. You know, it, it's, it's really this kind of odd discussion that we're having right now of well, what's the more appropriate. And so thinking about nesting, right? If you're say, oh, well, this command is, you know, T4321.0005, is it also T4321 just in and of itself because they are kind of discrete line items. And so thinking about, well, how do we model these behaviors and do we allow for multi-tagging and what does that mean from an offensive and defensive and reporting and automation standpoint? That's going to be one of the weird, tricky things that vendors specifically, but all of us have to deal with. It's multi-tagging and how we want to think about that. Um, so... Awesome. Yeah, there's awesome. lots of opinions on it. Awesome answer. Um, I guess we, we will see, right? Then the beta is out. Um, not mm -hmm. everything has migrated to the beta. One of the uh, tools I like to use is um, Attack Navigator, and that beta is out for that, mm -hmm. at least for the enterprise. Um, there are a few other questions here, and we do have time. We have about five more minutes, so okay. um, do, do want to answer some of these. Um, Sima has asked about uh, control systems and how that maps to the matrix. Um, I, th I think the answer for that is that there is a MITRE attack for ICS, right? There is, yeah. 
and, yeah. and there's one for cloud as well. So um, the original one is enterprise, and then huh? you have for ICS and for cloud. Um, and then this other question here is, um, it seems that attack is very approachable tool for helping entry level security uh, people. How, do you think that's the case? Should someone start that's getting into security start with MIDAR attack? Or what's your opinions on that? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think absolutely it's a great place to get started because um, it's not only is it something that now more and more organizations are asking about, well, oh, dear, how familiar are you with the attack matrix? But it's a great way to, to wrap your head around certain threat actors and specific behaviors, right? And, and uh, the learning curve, although it, it's there and the attack matrix has a lot of information, it could be a little overwhelming. Um, it's once you spend some time with it, especially if you go through and use that exercise I recommended where you take the attack navigator and you start to color in things that you think are cool or important or dangerous or otherwise uh, based on a scoring system, it's a really tangible way to start learning about threat actors, learning about behaviors, and then for people just starting out, ways to execute those because there's lots of example commands in there. Um, and again, resist the temptation to say, oh, this command is always this technique and I'm done now. But as long as you can think about it and say, oh, I now have a better understanding of this flow and the way I can talk about it with people who may not be in the same field, you've achieved the goal. And that's a great thing for people to start, who are just starting out to, to try. So, yeah. Awesome. Definitely. This one's uh, going to be a little tougher. It's from Lindsay. And they say, so the new threat pebble dash. So I actually had to Google this one because uh, it's been a hectic week, believe it or not. Um, and um, I saw US CERT publish something about it, um, mm -hmm. and it didn't map back to MITRE attack. So the question is, how would you categorize it? So I'm gonna go slow here, I'm not sure if you see it on the Q&A, but it's a Trojan with capabilities to download, upload, delete, and execute files. That's one part. Then it enables Windows CLI access to create and terminate processes and then perform target system enumeration. So can you map that back to MITRE attack? Oh, absolutely, right? And, and that's one of those cool things. If you could just like take a look at it, and uh, I mean, it's a little, I mean, they really hit the buzzword bingo on that threat act. <laughs> nice. Uh, and, but what's cool is that you could absolutely like pick out the individual IDs on those things and you'd be off to the races. I mean, it, it's, it's really straightforward and you could just do a, you know, a find on the given page and, and all of the attack navigator has searches and the like there so this is the that's what makes this so tangible right is you could take something a brand new threat actor that nobody's yet categorized and you could sit there as an exercise and be like i'm just going to categorize it myself over lunch and then oh look i use the navigator to produce my own report and i've already pre-graded these different threat actor behaviors and the ones I think that we should test our detections for in order. Like you could just do that in 30 minutes if you were so inclined. So. I actually, I, I, while you talked, I looked it up. So the command line interface is T1059. Mm -hmm. Then you had a Trojan, which we're gonna guess uh, was in, you know, mapped to some other executable. So probably user execution, mm -hmm. uh, file and directory discovery T1083 maybe network shared discovery T1135. So yeah, I mean, that, that was obviously 30 <laughs> seconds of, uh, of just looking at my direct back, but yes, for sure, right? Um, and one of the things, you know, just kind of to add to that is we definitely want to push the threat intelligence folks, right? They, you know, everyone's seen that pyramid of pain to map to MITRE attack, right? Map to these TTP. So then, you know, again, CTI now provides us the defenders or the red teams a way to emulate this and to test ourselves and, and to be better. But really fantastic, fantastic presentation, um, Adam. I really appreciate it. Yeah.